Hi, Nicholas Vince here. This week on The Chattering Hour, I'm joined by Ryan Lambert. Some of you may remember him from Disney's long-running TV show Kids Incorporated or his appearance on It's Gary Shandling's show. But many of you will no doubt remember him for his appearance in the classic horror film Monster Squad. Up next on The Chattering Hour, Ryan Lambert. As well as being an actor, Ryan is a producer, writer and musician in bands such as Elephone and Kill Moi. Let's get to it. Ryan, thank you very much indeed for joining me here today. Absolutely, my pleasure. Cool, so let me take you right back to the very beginning. Where did you grow up? Uh, I was born in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, my parents grew up there, um, but they moved us out to Los Angeles when I was about three. So I grew up in LA. Right. What, were your, what was your parents' reason for moving? Oh, it was just t typical, like my dad got a job and we just moved out west and uh, yeah, my dad drove out first and then uh, me and my brother and my mother flew out to here. He, he like, you know, he got an apartment for us and the whole thing set right. us up. Actually, he thought like when we got there uh, here, I'm in LA right now. Uh, he he thought he knew L.A. already, like, oh, I'll show you all the sights and everything. <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> what was your dad doing? What work was your dad doing? He's a salesman. Right. So he was, uh, he, he, he started out at a, at a few different jobs, and then he, he wound up working at a, at a company called Z Fish, which is by the airport. It's, a, it's a, basically a warehouse for, like, aquarium uh, shops. Right. So like turtles and fish and, uh, you know, snakes and spiders, <laughs> just whatever kind of pet you put in like a little cage or something like that. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> we but, always had strange oddities in our home. <laughs> so what was a um, what was a fun day for you as a kid when you were growing up? What sort of thing did you get up to? Obviously, I grew up in an era without, you know, uh, any internet or any computers or anything like that. Although my father was really into like the latest thing that came out. Like, so we had Pong, the game Pong. Uh, I had Atari, like right when it came out. Uh, but mostly, I, I actually like, we, you know, at, at that time, uh, it, it, was, it was more about being outside. I, 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 I like to skate. I was a skateboarder. Uh, we used to run around the neighborhood unsupervised uh you know in los angeles you know we would skate down pico boulevard and we'd go to santa monica and watch the watch all the older kids the dog town i don't know if you know what dog town is but like uh, it, it's like a, a famous a skating group of kids um they've made several movies about it actually uh so i got to i actually got to watch those kids uh, skate. I didn't know what I was doing, but uh, it was fun to watch them. Uh, yeah, I, when I was six, Star Wars came out. So, I mean, that was sort of my life. Right. Uh, all the toys and the, yeah, you know, I saw it like maybe 30 times in the theaters. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, also, music was a big part of my growing up. My father is sort of like an aficionado of, uh, 50s and 60s and 70s uh, like rock pop and soul he knows everything so our house was always full of music and records playing and so yeah I learned a lot about music from from my father right so apart from so obviously Star Wars were you watching any other films or particular tv shows Star Wars was the only thing in my life that was it no <laughs> <laughs> uh I used to actually love I I like to um PBS was an interesting uh, uh, station at that time, still is and always will be. But uh, at that time, it was, uh, I love Doctor Who. 
I used to, I was obsessed with Doctor Who, uh, the Tom Baker Doctor Who. Right, right. And uh, so, you know, I'd be watching something else. Saturday morning cartoons were big in, uh, in my household. So I'd get up and I'd make myself a big bowl of cereal and I'd sit in front of the TV and watch, uh, you know, old Looney Tunes cartoons and the Smurfs and all that stuff. But then you turn to PBS and it was Doctor Who. My mom was always like, what are you watching? Insanity. Like it doesn't make any sense, and like the sets are wobbly, and like it's a terrible looking show. But I, I, I like sci-fi, you know, when I was a kid. So and horror. So there was a lot of there was a lot of Doctor Who in my house that I, I was pretty much the only one watching, and I, I, they thought I was a lunatic for watching that. Right, <laughs> right. Well, I, I think I've never told this story on this show before, but basically, I was in my late teens when Doctor Who, uh, Tom Baker was Doctor Who, and I got yeah. myself a 23 foot long scarf. I think I had about three of them. I used to wear these, you know, a long coat and a fedora uh -huh. hat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, I love that look. I thought that look was extraordinary. And uh, I, wanted to be, I wanted to be Tom Baker, uh, Doctor Who for Halloween one year, and I couldn't find the scarf. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so I many, it next it <laughs> yeah i think many mothers and grandmothers and aunts were conned into knitting extraordinarily knitting yeah <laughs> extraordinarily long discards so trying to find a t-shirt for um trying to find jody whitaker's t-shirt for her doctor because right. i want to i want to i want to be her for halloween right <laughs> i don't think i'm gonna be able to pull it off this year but uh I'm gonna get like a blonde wig and get her shirt and the coat and everything. Yeah, she's, she, I would say uh, she became my second doctor. Really? Really? Yeah, yeah I, I, David Tennant was probably my second for a long time. And then when Jody took over the role, I was like, oh, wow, this is incredible. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, huge kudos. I can't remember if they've actually announced who the replacement there's lots of speculation going on as to who they're always, replacing there always, there always is yeah yeah I'd yeah to announce right now uh i'm actually playing the <laughs> <laughs> i'm the next that, doctor <laughs> that would be a scoop that would definitely be a scoop that would be that would make a lot of people really upset <laughs> <laughs> And guarantee you're never getting the the role, I guess. Yeah. Never, <laughs> ever. I'm, so, not, I'm not ever going to play James Bond or Doctor Who. No, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so how did you how did you get into the business? Because you started at really quite a young age. Yeah, I did. Um, I always I, I was always kind of like a performer. I like to. Um, I was always in like the little school things and. And then I found this uh, this little studio in Simi Valley, California, called Bill Edwards On Stage Studios, and it was it was musical comedy. So I, you know, I was about you know nine or ten, and I'm I, you know I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy. I had the top hat and cane and the whole thing, and uh, and I just I loved it. I loved being on stage. I, I never was nervous. I always felt excited to get up there. And uh, that eventually turned into uh, my mother finding uh, an audition uh, for, do you remember, remember this? Remember We Are the World? Yes. We are the world. So uh, they did a kid's version of it. And they got a bunch of child actors to do like the main parts, but they needed like a chorus of, of kids. And uh, I auditioned for that. Um, and I didn't get it. Uh, I actually did get it, but I wouldn't do it because they wanted, my hair was like really spiky at the time, kind of looked punk rock. And, uh, they asked me to cut it. And I said, uh, F you, I'm not doing that. So I, I'm rebellious at an early age, <laughs> but, uh, the, the people that were sort of doing that also produced this other show, uh, and asked me to come and audition for that, like an actual television show my very first audition ever it was in the exact same spot that i auditioned for the we are the world thing it's called children of the world and uh they 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 scoured the nation they went to chicago they went to new york they went all over la and so i was like one of like i don't know 
7,000 kids. And uh, I actually got it. I got it. It was my very first job, my very first audition. It's my, my very first job. It was a show called Kids Incorporated. And uh, it was a musical show. Uh, we were a band. And uh, there was acting involved. There was dancing, which I sucked at. I, I still to this day don't understand how I got this thing, but uh, I did sort of change my life, sort of changed my life, I absolutely changed my life. <laughs> I, I was watching clips of it today. And... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I, you know, I wasn't familiar with it. Well. <laughs> no, you did well. You did well. So well, thank you. How long did you spend on the show then? Uh, I did five seasons. I did five seasons. It's one of those shows that were like, you know, you do it, you do it, and then you grow up, and then they kick you off, and they get younger kids to do it. Right. So, how old were you when you started, and how old were you when you finished then? I was thirteen. I was about to turn thirteen when uh, on the first season, and then I think I was about uh, sixteen when I when I when they when they dumped me. <laughs> That's incredibly mean. So how how many hours were you working a week? And what was this was a weekly show, I guess. It's a weekly show. It was one. Of, it was like a Saturday morning show. It was syndicated at first, and then it moved to the the Disney Channel, which was new at the time. Uh, it was a grueling schedule. It, we worked uh, from Monday through Saturday, uh, and we did three shows a week. So we would, we would come in on Monday with three scripts and we would rehearse and block the, all the dialogue scenes for all three shows. And then on Tuesday, we would shoot those. And then uh, Wednesday, we would rehearse the live numbers, uh, the live musical numbers. And then the next day we would shoot them for all three episodes. And then the next day, that we, every episode had like a big production number in the middle of the episode. And then uh, we would rehearse those on Friday and then shoot those on Saturday. And then, then at the, when the day was over, they would give us the scripts for the next week. And so on Sunday, I would go home and I'd have to learn my lines and start uh, remembering the songs that we recorded beforehand. So I was basically, it, it, was, all, it was all summer. We, we, we shot all summer. So from the time I was about 13 to how, whatever, when I finished, I, I literally never had like that typical chill childhood summer. That's why I was working. Right, right. Do you regret that? Do you feel you missed out? Um, sometimes I do. And sometimes I think, well, the kids that did get to do that, they didn't get to do what I did. Mm. <laughs> Not many kids got to do what I did. So I, I feel sort of lucky special in that regard for sure right right, right. now the, after you dealt, after you've done that after you left that you then went on to doing monster squad how did monster squad come about i did the monster squad uh uh in between two of the seasons of kids incorporated ah. yeah so um just regular i mean you know you go on an audition and you get it and you do the job uh, that was three months, and that was actually during the school year. So I got taken out of, I, I, didn't, I didn't get to go to regular high school because my first week of going to uh, my first year of high school, I got that film and I was taken out and we had a uh, school on the set. And I was there for about three months. And after that, the school that I was supposed to be in well, wouldn't let me back. They're like, you, you didn't go here. It's been three months. You didn't, you can't just pop in now. <laughs> so I had to find like a little private school for actors. And uh, that was the rest of my, my schooling was in this little tiny private school. What, what did you, um, do you have any particular favorite subjects when you were studying? I, I like to, I like to read. Uh, and in that little private school, my English teacher gave me, uh, gave us a book that I wasn't particularly in love with at the time. 
uh, I found it boring and I won't say what it is, but uh, she noticed that and said, I think I know what kind of uh, literature you like. So what do you think of this? And she gave me a book and I went home and I read it and I fell in love. And it was uh, The Picture of Dorian Gray. Oh. And, and from then on, that was it. I, I, was, I was off and running with Oscar Wilde and Edgar Allan Poe. And I, I started to discover those. Uh, my mother was actually really into Stephen King. Um, she wouldn't let me read it when I was young, but I, I stole uh, Pet Cemetery from her after she had finished it she put it up on the shelf and i was i wanted it i'm like that looks the cover looked amazing with the church the cat on the cover and uh so that i want i started reading it and i lost my mind like literally lost my mind and so like she had them all the previous novels carrie cujo the stand shining and so i went back and i you know i asked her if i could read them and she said okay and from then on that was it. I've read every single word that man has ever written. Ah, interesting. So thinking about, you know, the going back to uh, Monster Squad for a moment, were you a fan of the Universal horror films before you started that film? Yeah, that was one of the things. Like, uh, I, I was a big TV head when I was a kid. I, I loved just sitting in front of the television, just watching anything I could, just soaking up anything. And uh, obviously, like late at night, uh, whoever was the host, whether it was Elvira or uh, there was another guy, I can't remember his name right now. He's out of Cleveland. My, my mom used to uh, uh, show me him uh, something ghouly, ghouly. He was amazing. But they'd show though, they'd show Dracula, Frankenstein, the mummy, uh, Jekyll and Hyde, the Wolfman. I love that stuff. The thing I didn't like in real, I liked watching the films, but in real life, I didn't like see, as a little kid, I didn't want to see people wearing masks. For some reason that freaked me out. It didn't matter if it was a monster or if it was like Richard Nixon mask. Like I just didn't like someone putting something over their face and hiding, it, it bothered me. So I was very scared. So when we were on the set of Monster Squad, which I'm, literally standing around Frankenstein and Dracula and the Wolfman and the mummy and the Gill Man uh, in these costumes, mom turned to me and said, can you believe you're doing this? <laughs> and I said, I know. And she goes, how are you doing this? Because this usually freaks you out. And I said, mom, it's called acting. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you have a favorite monster? Did you have a favorite of the out of the universal monsters? Um, I have a few, but I think one of my favorites because I love the film so much is the uh, the Bride of Frankenstein because I I think her look is super cool, and also that film is out of control bonkers. Oh, yeah. Like it, it's like it's like a David Lynch film. It's so weird. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I did. I think it's Polidori. The Yes, the, yeah. the, it, amazing. How, what an yeah. image, what a thing. And it was also made up. Yeah. Because it wasn't a book. It wasn't, it, there was no previous, you know, knowledge of this character. I mean, we had, you know, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Brom Stoker's Dracula. But this was like, what is this? Yeah. This yeah. is insane. It must have blown people's minds when it came out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Extraordinary, extraordinary. So you're... On the set of um, uh, Monster Squad, do you have a particularly fond memory of being on the set? There's a few for sure. Um, I'd never been in like a, a film film before. I was just on television. So uh, I was learning the process as, as we went along. But the, the, the very first scene where my character Rudy comes in uh, is the very first scene I shot myself, which I mean, it could not get more badass than you know, showing up in a film that way. He he, he <laughs> skids to a halt on a bike. He lights a he, he lights a match on the bottom of his shoe, and then he goes up and he lights a cigarette, and he saves a kid from being bullied 
on a schoolyard. He's smoking on a school. It's like, who doesn't? That's insane. Never be able to get away with that now, ever. So that was an amazing experience right there um, because the director, Fred Decker, uh, talked to me a little bit beforehand. He said, um, so what you're gonna do is this is your mark. Can you ride up on the bike and skid and literally hit your mark right here? And then do the, then we're gonna pan up and do the thing. And I said, yes. And I took a little start and I, he said, action. I'm riding the bike and then I pull in, did light the match, camera goes up. I light the cigarette and I say my first line. And Fred says, cut, print. Like one take Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> From then on, I've, I've always called myself one take Ryan. I could do this in one take, I got it. <laughs> That, that was an amazing memory, but also like the, the, the whole end sequence where we're basically like killing all the monsters is, I mean, yeah. you know, I'm killing the mummy, I'm killing the wolf man, I'm killing three vampire brides with stakes, I'm staking them in the heart. I mean, come on. <laughs> I have to say, you know, and the obvious question after having watched the opening, you know, your opening um, entrance into the film is, were you a smoker at that age? <laughs> we used to uh you know clove cigarettes yeah we used to sneak those like behind the dugout at my school you know uh so i had smoked i wasn't a smoker but i i knew i knew how to do it and, and the funny thing is is i can reveal this after 35 years but uh the prop guy said uh as a prop, it has to look like a real pack of cigarettes. So here's a pack of Marlboro, Marlboros, because those are the most recognizable on screen. But inside are vegetable cigarettes. And so I, I ducked behind a thing and I tried one and I was like, there's no way I'm smoking. That is disgusting. I'm not gonna be able to act and do that. Uh, so uh, I asked him, I said, can you put, can you, put real cigarettes in the pack? Like, can it just be a pack of Marlboros? And he said, I just don't think I'm allowed to do that. And I said, eh, you know, just do it. And he did. So the only people that knew that I was actually smoking real cigarettes were me and the prop guy. His name was Bob, Bill, Bob, Bob. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, can, I can't imagine acting with something other than you know, a decent, if you're going to have to smoke. Yeah, yeah. Just smoke. It's also yeah. in the script. And people always ask me, like, oh, wow, like, you, you, you know, you smoked in that movie. That's crazy. Did they, like, did they put that in later? And I said, no, because I, when, I, when I auditioned for the part, I, I, if, you, if you see the character in the film, that's really, that's actually what I looked like in the audition. Like I had a leather jacket on, I brought the, the Ray-Ban glasses, they were on top of my head. And Shane Black, the writer uh, of the film with Fred, um, he, had a, he had a pack of marbles in his pocket in the audition. And I said, hey, can I, can I grab one of those? And they looked at each other and they were like, are we supposed to, are we allowed to do this? And Shane goes, we, we wrote it in, it's in the script. He rolls up the cigarette, you know, it's in the script. So I lit up in the audition <laughs> and did the scene. <laughs> what was I supposed to do? And, and, and Fred said, Fred tells, told, tells me years later, he goes, that, that there was no way you weren't the guy. Like the minute you did all that, it was like, you're the guy. And everybody so, else sitting, everybody else sitting in the lobby waiting to rehearse, like just they could have gone home right then. <laughs> <laughs> Which was a couple kids that actually wound up being in the film, including uh, Andre Gower, who was the, the star of the film. Um, he auditioned for Rudy first, but when I when I walked in, it was like, oh, well, forget that. <laughs> <laughs> 
but they wound up making him the star of the movie. So yeah, whatever. Yeah, I'm sure he's not. Yeah, I don't think he's fine. He's fine. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, how big a deal was it at the time in terms of a? Did you have a premiere for the film? Premiere was insane. There were two of them. One was in Los Angeles. They were both at the Hard Rock Cafe. One in Los Angeles uh, by the Beverly Center, and and then the Hard Rock Cafe in New York City. Um, it was a who's who. It, I mean, Arnold Schwarzenegger was there. Michael Douglas was there. Kiefer Sutherland was there. It was insane. This movie was supposed to be huge. I mean, it was supposed to be this mammoth Spielbergian thing that came out. And uh, so the premieres were big. Uh, Billy Crystal sat in front of me during the actual viewing of the production. And I was so nervous, I was kicking the back of his chair. And my best friend, Adam Carl, who's also in the film, is sitting next to me during, and, and I'm kicking Billy's chair. And Billy turns around and yells at Adam, Stop kicking my goddamn chair. <laughs> now, Adam, one of Adam's heroes was Billy Crystal. So when he turned back around, Adam was devastated. Oh my, oh my God. And I just looked at Adam, I was like, <laughs> it was me, I was doing it. So I, so year, a few years later, I was at a, a Lakers game and I saw Billy Crystal and I told him that story. I said, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Chris. It was actually me that was kicking your chair. And he goes, what was your friend's name? I said, Adam. He goes, cool, uh, tell Adam to go fuck himself. <laughs> so, <laughs> he knew, he, he knew. <laughs> no, you say it wasn't the big commercial success that you know everybody had hoped for. Um, Totally bombed. Totally bombed. Did did that have a direct effect on your career, or did because you said he made it in the middle of you were still making Kids Incorporated at the, the time? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I just went back. Well, right after. I mean, they they said that's a wrap on Ryan, on Monster Squad, and my and my mother drove me to the Kids Incorporated set. I just started working right away. So that was done did that and then we waited for the monster squad to come out we did the premieres and then it was released um uh did not do good business there's a few reasons why um the marketing was terrible terrible marketing uh notoriously terrible oh. um, it also came out the same week of the lost boys oh. so <clears throat> one, on one, on the one hand, you had the fact that the Lost Boys was for older kids. It was cool. Um, and then our film was sort of like for younger kids, but parents wouldn't take them to see it because it looked a little too scary. And then the marketing was absolutely atrocious. <clears throat> they put up all these wanted posters all over town wanted Dracula for this and that. It was like, what is this? It didn't make any sense. I mean, and with terrible like taglines, um, I think the mom, the, and, it, and it was a wanted poster. So it, you know, it said like what they were wanted for. And like the mummies was like for statutory rap. I mean, it was like really bad. And also the monsters on the posters were not the monsters from the film. They were like different actors. It was really bad. Like the, it, it could have been like a you know, a call to arms type thing. Now, if it was like on on the internet, you know, if the, if the internet existed, you could have like teased it a little bit, and maybe people would be like, "What the hell is this?" And then you then you release the trailer and things like that. But back then, you just put up this dumb poster. It just didn't work. It didn't right. work. Right. Right. No one went to see it. No one went to see it. Because it's a really cool. As you say, it's a younger kids movie. It's a lot of fun. It's got a lot of heart, and I love the you know Andre's relationship with his father character. Rudy, obviously yourself, is just he's just the coolest kid on in the school playground, and there's just lots of lovely 
moments. So I, that's really interesting to know. So you did that, you went on, to, you carried on with doing Kids Incorporated, but eventually you kind of drifted away from acting. Did you, was that a deliberate decision on your part? Absolutely. There was a few factors involved with that too. I mean, one was, I sort of started out like with music. Kids Incorporated was a musical show. I was doing musical theater before that and I loved rock and roll. So it, it started, to, I started to get all these other little parts on like these terrible sitcoms and, and a few that were amazing. I worked with Gary Shandling on, on one episode of his show. Uh, and then I did another film and then I was done. I'm like, I don't want to do this anymore. I, 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 I love acting, but like there were some other things I didn't, I, I actually had my bags packed for a few <clears throat> films that I got signed contracts for and then it just somehow blew up and didn't work. And so I didn't do the film. And then it, those films went on to be like these huge successful classic films. And I just was like, I got a, not, not so much discouraged more than just, I gotta get out. I wanna do music now. I wanna be a, I wanna be a rock star. That's what I thought. So I quit, I quit, said, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. And, you know, no regrets. Can't say I have any re regrets on that because I've had a wonderful life as a musician. Um, but but uh, I lived in San Francisco for 15 years and about year 13, I, I started to watch I've always watched a million shows, but I started to really watch things. I'm like, I could have done that. I could have been that guy in that thing. And I missed it. I missed like the smell of a set. I miss being on a set. I miss the, the lingo. I miss, you know, the, I miss the AD yelling at everyone. <laughs> you know, I miss, I miss the whole thing. So I, <laughs> hardest job on the set. Yeah. Uh, and I just, I, I went back and I just, I started to do some theater in San Francisco just to get my chops going. And uh, eventually I tried to find an agent in uh, San Francisco and no one would take me. They all had the same excuse, which was, uh, I, I can't resurrect your career, Ryan. And I kept telling them, that's not what I'm doing. Like, literally dead body number two on law and order. You know what I mean? Like, I don't care what it is. I just want to be on the set. And so I said, you know what? I got to move back to LA. And here I am six years later. And uh, uh, still, I called all my friends when I first got here. Everyone, all my acting friends from when I was a kid, I'm like, can you introduce me to your agent? Can I do that? I'm trying to like find an agent. It was just, uh, it was nothing until I got a wonderful email uh, from a wonderful person that said, hey, I was just wondering what you're doing now. Are you still acting? And I said, as a matter of fact, I'm trying to find someone to represent me to send me on auditions. And I met with her and, and, and that was it. She, that was Karen. Right. And, and she, uh, just was the only person that that really uh, believed in me and, and worked really hard to to get me in the door which she has done so uh, and then of course she uh, hooked up with Chris and now well the rest is history yes. <laughs> yeah the yeah. Is history. yeah good history <laughs> which is how we now I have a wonderful team working for me and I couldn't be happier that's cool so when did you first become aware that uh, Monster Squad there was a cult following for Monster Squad I was in San Francisco it was 2006 I got an email from a guy named Eric Vespi who was uh sort of a staff writer on a website called Ain't It Cool News. Uh, very, I mean, just movie related, nerd, you know, geeky stuff. Uh, knows every little 
piece of film history that has ever existed ever. And he said, hey, uh, there's a theater in Austin, Texas. It's called the Alamo Draft House. And we're gonna do a screening of The Monster Squad. It's my favorite movie ever. I found a 35 print. We're gonna screen it. And I would love for you to come and say hi to the fans. And I said, what fans? He said, oh, you don't know? This movie is huge. I'm like, you're, you're kidding me. There's no way, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. There's gonna be like four people in the theater, maybe. And one of them's gonna be me. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 trust me. Like it's, it, it snowballed. It, it like, it, it found an audience on VHS and Laserdisc and people have been loving this thing forever. They wore out their V, copied it off of HBO. They've been watching it for years. It's their favorite thing ever. Like you've got, to, okay, fine. So what happened? What do we do? He says, I'm gonna fly you out to Austin. I'm gonna put you in a hotel. We're gonna pay for your food, everything. And you're just gonna talk before the show, before the movie and after the movie. And I said, oh, this, I gotta see this. <laughs> I gotta see what this is. And I went, it was Easter weekend, two sold out screenings, fans losing their marbles, like screaming every, every line. I had no idea these lines were becoming iconic. Wolfman's got nards. I'm in the goddamn club, aren't I? Like these things, it's like, they've been, they've, they're on t-shirts. I'm like, what? Is what is happening? <laughs> and then from there on, from it was just then we did another screen, then we did this, then we did the conventions. And it's I just got back from uh, uh, we went to Manchester, where you know you at Lo well, I met you in London. Yeah. Uh, and then we we just did another one in uh, outside of Philadelphia, and it's just. It's heartwarming. It's amazing. You see, you were. I'm. I'm a part of something that's a cult classic. Who gets to do that? Yeah. You know, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Well, so was Andre at the um the first screening at the Alamo? Andre, Andre it was me, Andre, uh, Ashley Bank, who played Phoebe, the little girl, who actually is the hero of the entire piece, and uh, and Fred Decker, the director. Right. It was the four. Yeah. Right, we, right. I hadn't seen them since the film. So we were like, what is going on here? This is so bizarre. Oh, cool. Do you have, so you, you've mentioned that you've, you've done a number of conventions over the years. Do you have a particular favorite fan reaction or meeting from doing conventions? Man, it's, it's a little, it's overwhelming. Sometimes, um, the last convention we did in Philly, like this man uh, was waiting. I could see him in line, but then when we finally got to talk, he full from head to toe, like brilliant Frankenstein's monster costume, makeup like prosthetic makeup. The everything it wasn't just a mask, and it <laughs> just blew my mind. And he he had done this only to meet us. It wasn't like he was there to do anything else. He, he, he bought a ticket to this thing. He stood in line, dressed as Frankenstein's monster only to meet us. And that's an interesting dynamic in your life, you know, to, to see that. Yeah. And, but they're always so cordial. Yeah. And, and, you know, you could say that there's a sprinkling of madness, but most of the time they're, they just, that's all they, they just want to say hi. Yeah. That's all. They've been watching yeah. it forever. Uh, they, they've shown it to their kids. Now their kids are dressed up in the costumes. Generations. I met someone that, 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 uh, that loved it when they were a kid. They actually were one of the, I don't know, seven people that saw it in the theater. And, and they, and then they introduced their kids and then I met their kids, like her grandkids. So it's just this thing that 
we have posters on our wall at home and like i it just keeps it's it i don't think it's ever going to go away it's kind of like rocky horror picture show you know in that sense it's it's just one of those things that's just going to always be around yeah and uh if there's going to be something in my life that is always around it might as well be something that's that fucking yeah. rat <laughs> <laughs> Incorporated can whoosh over to the side, but monsters. <laughs> I love kids incorporated. Don't <laughs> yeah, I can see myself in those sequin jackets. I'm like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because you were making kids incorporated in the 1980s. That there's just some amazing fashions in the 1980s. Oh my lord! And the hair and the shoulders and the, the hair yeah. and the, yeah, it's insane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah, and you do remind me. It, it's I, I remember the first time that somebody actually came up to me dressed as the Chatterer um, right. from Hell, and it's just like, whoa, this really what? shows dedication because you can't, you can hardly see. Man, this is... that was a crazy character, by the way. Let me just say that. Thank you. <laughs> Every time I see Hellraiser, I'm like, that is Pinhead is what great Pinhead, but my God, the Chatterer. <laughs> <That's just laughs> <scary as> shit. <laughs> well thank you <laughs> so um that kind of brings us more or less up to date have you got anything uh else coming up well you know i mean i'm, I'm auditioning for things and hopefully something amazing will, will come up I, I i'm still playing music still in a band sort of um i have a record that i've that's finished and so we're just sort of waiting for that to pop out, we'll see what happens. It's just being mastered. At What's, the the name? So What's the name of the band? The band's called Kill Moi. Ah. Right, so we have right, yes, I found Kill Moi. Oh, this sounds fun. What, do you do, uh, I was gonna say, you do leads and guitar on this? Yeah, I'm the lead singer, uh, primary songwriter, sort of. Uh, I've got a couple of partners that we write with that I write with. Um, our first record is out. Uh, find it on Bandcamp right now. I, 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 it got taken down off Amazon because we weren't paying enough to <laughs> have it sit there. But uh, that record, the first record was called Hold Me Motherfucker. And now the second record that's coming out is, is called No Seriously, Hold Me Motherfucker. So that should be out. As soon as I can get it out, I'll get it out. <laughs> <laughs> are you doing the engineering for that or are you just? It's finished, it's done. It just needs to be mastered and uh, I gotta find some artwork and then just find someone to release it or release it ourselves kind of thing. Music business is kind of screwed up right now as far as rock and roll is concerned, it's hard. Um, no one wants to hear bands unless it's like underground indie, but like the record industry is strictly, you know, pop and hip hop now. Um, so it's a little tough, it's a little tough, but right. I just want to put it out. Just, just, I just want to get it out. Right. I don't right. care what happens with it. I'm not trying to like be, you know, like playing Wembley anytime soon. That would be <laughs> nice. Well, great. Yeah. I mean, that's what I thought was going to happen, you know, my whole life. <laughs> Never did. <it. laughs> cool. All right. Well, we could keep an eye out for that. So what I'd like to, um, coming to the end of our time together, so I'd like to ask you the questions I always ask, the luggage in the crypt the luggage questions. <laughs> so if with about to go into the afterlife what film would you take with you man there's like 30 that i always say are my favorite film of all time <laughs> and it changes every day of course. Um, i think i think the film that 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 always sort of pops into my head to watch over and over again is Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I think it's the perfect film. The, obviously, Dreyfus and Terry Garr, and I mean, they're, you know, just genius actors. It looks amazing. It's, a, 
it's a sci-fi film and it's an alien film, but it's not a scary alien film. It's, it's about believing in something that you, something that maybe shouldn't exist. And people uh, like people not believing in something that we all know is out there. We all know it's there. We're just waiting for it to arrive in our world. And in that film, it does. And it's a secret. No one knows that it's happening except for those chosen to be involved with that and the music just gets me every time it's so simple the most simple i mean john williams it, it, he does extravagant things star wars raiders of the lost ark those are big huge scores but when you just hear almost better than any rock song I've ever heard. Yeah, yeah. You want to you listen to the best so soundtrack of all time? Boo-doop. Boo-doop. It's two notes on a piano. I mean, he wrote it on piano. It's actually tuba. But, yeah. I mean, it doesn't get better than that. You just can't have a, 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 a classic film without those kind of, those kind of feelings, those soundtracks, you know? And then I'm going Spielberg here, but uh, E.T. is the thing that kind of changed my life. That's why I wanted to act. When I saw Elliot, when I saw Henry Thomas, I saw E.T. opening day at the Cinerama Dome. I just looked at the screen and I said, I can do that. I want to be, I want to be Elliot. And so E.T. kind of changed my life. But then we can go, you know, After Hours is one of my favorite films. Ah. Scorsese after hours, I, I can watch that daily. Um, wow, I mean, there's just, I mean, Blade Runner is one of my favorite films. Uh, Sid and Nancy, Ghost World, I can go on and on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite, yeah, there's an absolutely fascinating. I, I like all the old, like, French noir stuff, you know. Um, I was just watching this film. Wait, I got I got I woke up this morning uh, to talk to you, and I always have the station on that's in, in that's in Los Angeles, probably everywhere, but uh, it's just on antenna TV. You just turn on your TV and you kind of do the rabbit ears, and uh, it's called movies. It's just called movies, and they, all they do is play movies all day. There's no hosts or other shows just a bunch of films and they're doing uh because it's october they're just playing all those they're playing house of dracula they're playing you know all the hammer stuff which i adore uh but they, i turned it on this morning this movie called you'll find out and it's with uh it's it's bella lugosi boris karloff and peter Lorre. and it is a horror comedy musical it is absolutely bonkers. <laughs> it's insane. If anybody that's out there listen, just go find this film. You'll die. It's, it is so weird. And Peter Lorre is at his best creepiness you've ever seen. He's so creepy in it. It's great. I have never heard of this film before. Oh, yeah, I had neither. I had neither. I did not know it existed. But now I do. And now it's like I want the poster like over my bed. It's, right. it's insane. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay what about a book books <clears throat> well we already talked about Stephen uh, obviously I gotta bring um, maybe the dark half maybe the shining um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of a, a, a Japanese writer named Haruki Murakami um, uh, so his book, one of his one of his novels, The Wind Up Bird Chronicle, is 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 maybe one of my favorites ever. I gotta bring Dorian Gray because that's kind of how it started off. 
<laughs> uh, anything by Chuck Palahniuk. Palahniuk, uh, however you want to say it. Um, he's sort of like one of my one of my hero hero novelists. Okay. Okay. And what about now? Oh, this is going to be tough. What about an album? A album of music. Forget it. Forget <laughs> it. I can't even answer that one. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I can go on and on. Um, <laughs> probably never mind the Bullocks first. Um, maybe the Joshua Tree. Uh, literally any, it just it doesn't matter which album, just anything that Paul McCartney is singing on sort of started me off playing music. Sort of, I mean, I, 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 I know it's kind of cliche, but I, 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 I do, I do uh, chalk up learning how to play guitar from the Beatles for sure, because I'm I play left-handed, and uh, no one would teach me. No, I couldn't get a teacher when I was eight years old. I couldn't find a teacher. Um, so my mother bought me a big book. It's called the Beatles Bible. Just open the book and it, it's in alphabetical order, the first song across the universe. And I just was like putting my finger, I saw like the little chord structures and I was like, okay, if the right handed person's fingers there, then I'm here. I'm doing this. Okay. Strum. It sounded like garbage. And I just kept practicing, practicing, practicing. So, like, once I got like seven or eight chords down, uh, then the whole Beatles book just opened up. And I just looked and I was like, words are flying out like endless rain. I found it. So uh, I always chalk up my, my musical abilities to a Sir Paul McCartney and uh, John Lennon. <laughs> okay, that's, that's a wonderful heritage to, yeah, to be learning from. What about... Actually, I, I, went to, I just got back from Liverpool. Never been there. Went for, for the first time. Took the cheesy Beatles tour. Went like on the magical mystery bus. Huh? They just showed me everything. Here's Penny Lane, here's Strawberry Fields, here's where Paul he lived, here's where John lived, and I'm just crying the whole time. <laughs> they're, playing, they're playing music over the bus. It was so cheesy, but loved every... I went to the cavern where they first played in Liverpool. Brilliant. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. What about a food or drink? Food. Oof. Um... Oh, my girlfriend just made this amazing pasta last night. <laughs> I'll take that anywhere. <laughs> she makes a mean chicken piccata too. <laughs> ah, okay. Okay. What about a drink? Jameson. A Jameson. Okay. Yes. That's not in here. That's not what, <laughs> not in here. <laughs> yes. For those of you not aware, it is very early in the morning for Ryan. Um, yeah. Late afternoon for me. Very early in the morning for Ryan. What about a piece of visual art, a painting or a sculpture? Oof. When I was a kid, I really liked, I really liked Dolly when I was a kid. Um, I thought it was just uh, this fantastical world uh, that was created by this sane mind. And so I sort of like leaned towards the, the, the bizarre, the, you know, the Hieronymus Her, Her, Bosch type, you know, art. Um, oh man, I saw, I saw a sculpture by Rodin once in Brooklyn and I was blown away. It was very simple. It wasn't that big. It was just a human figure. Mm. And I just thought like, how do you do that? Like I can write a song, I can act in a movie, but how do you like mold something to look like? I, I just have absolutely no concept of how to do that. Yeah. Um, my friend's a painter and her stuff blows me away sometimes. I just like, how do you, how do you like take the brush and, and flow it in those things? I just don't know how to do that. And the right. color patterns and, and, and things like that, it just, it's kind of mind blowing to me. So right. any, almost anything I see, um in that regard kind of blows my mind right right yeah you reminded me of going to the Rodin Museum in Paris and feeling exactly the same oh, thing it's just oh 
it's extraordinary because it's the way he manages to mold and sculpt things so that it's so organic and it's always growing out of you know even the thinker or you know the really famous ones but even just a simple hand just mm -hmm. growing out of the clay and um yeah, extraordinary a little extraordinary. his protege like Camille Claudel who was you know just a, 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 a a tragic figure like was almost better than him and i think he was so jealous of the fact that you know she could do things that he couldn't do so she didn't really get the recognition that mm. he did he gets all the credit for everything but she did a lot of those sculptures she did a lot of the the architecture sculptures that he did you know mm. she she was she was good at feet <laughs> but he always she was good at feet <laughs> <laughs> and finally what about a luxury something of no practical purpose but a luxury a luxury i mean really just uh i think being able to i mean this world is tough for a lot of people and just being able to Buy a ticket to see a film or buying a ticket to see a band, which I did last night. We went to see a band called Wilco and it was fantastic. And just having, having, having that, um, being allowed to do things like that to me and seeing art, being able to mm. go to a museum, um, those are luxuries to me. Just having access to, um, a fantastical world it's all out there to see um i never understand actors that say oh i don't really watch that many films i'm like you're not an actor you need to watch everything well some things are nah, i don't really want to watch the connors or whatever it's like you got to you got to watch everything you got to find all of it because you're going to get called up and they're going to say, you have an audition tomorrow for something. And if you don't know what it is or what the tone is of something that's already been established. So just having the, the luxury of, 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 of watching and, and learning, that to me is, that to me is super special. Yeah. 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 You know, I'm and, very the, and the Dodgers. <laughs> <laughs> And Doctor Who, we'll have to look at you. Doctor Who. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ryan, thank you very much indeed. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Love it. My thanks again to Ryan Lambert. And if you haven't already, please click the like button and subscribe for future shows. I'll be back again in a couple of weeks. And in the meantime, stay safe and well. Mm -hmm.